You're listening to the Sisters in Loss podcast, a faith-based grief and loss podcast for Black women, where you will hear stories of miscarriage, infant loss, stillbirth, and infertility to learn there is a testimony in tragedy. You will learn how to heal, gain clarity, find hope and peace, and turn your pain into your purpose after loss. I'm your host, Erica and McAfee. Welcome to episode 150 of the Sisters in Loss podcast. Did you know that preeclampsia is a leading cause of maternal mortality and prematurity? Did you know that black birthing persons are three times more likely to die from preeclampsia? Today's episode is a special one because it's our 150th episode. Can you believe it? We made it to 150. In honor of our 150th episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing the CEO of the Preeclampsia Foundation, Eleni Tiskas. A little background on Eleni. She is the CEO of the Preeclampsia Foundation and member of the Board of Directors of Preeclampsia Foundation Canada. As a preeclampsia survivor herself, Eleni is a relentless champion for the improvement of patient and provider education and practices for the catalytic role that patients can have to advance the science and status of maternal infant health, and for the progress that can be realized by building global partnerships to improve patient outcomes. In this episode, Alini shares her personal preeclampsia story, how we can support May, which is Preeclampsia Awareness Month, and why taking your blood pressure is critical for pregnant ladies and birthing persons, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. We also share how we met, connected, and how Sisters in Loss has partnered with the Preeclampsia Foundation on maternal mortality and racial disparities. This episode is for you to listen to if you've experienced preeclampsia, want to know how to partner with the Preeclampsia Foundation, and why blood pressures are critical during pregnancy. Here is Eleni Tiskas. Thank you so much, Eleni, for being on the Sisters in Loss podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is uh, this is definitely an honor for me as well. Awesome. So I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself and what you do. So my name is Eleni Tsigis. I am the CEO of the Preeclampsia Foundation. And the Preeclampsia Foundation, of course, is the nation's patient advocacy organization for preeclampsia and really all related hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, which is a fancy way of saying any of those medical conditions that have to do with high blood pressure in pregnancy and really a, a whole constellation of placental disorders in pregnancy. And so as the patient advocacy organization, our mission encompasses serving the community of the of the women and families affected, as well as advocating for and doing a number of, of different programs and services to improve healthcare practices in this area, and also driving research in this area. Yes, and that is one thing I do love about what you all do is the research and all of the patient advocates that you have out there. So I would love to talk about um, Preeclampsia Awareness Month. We are in May. It is Preeclampsia Awareness Month as well as Maternal Mental Health uh, Month. We're dealing with this COVID-19 and coronavirus crisis. And I would love for you to share more about what you all are doing this month um, to address preeclampsia, but also in lieu of COVID-19 and pregnant moms not being able to get the screening that they should normally get during um, normal routine visits, how are you all helping to address that? Yeah, could we possibly have any more going on at one time, right? (laughs) It's crazy. Absolutely. It's so crazy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, it's interesting because we obviously for the last several years. We, we first started Preeclampsia Awareness Month as an official national designation here in the United States back in um, 2013 was our first uh, official year. And so it, every year we try to have a different kind of focus or theme that we really hone in on. 
And it's really interesting because we had been planning for the 2020 year to really focus on blood pressure and the importance of knowing your blood pressure and how important it is in pregnancy and just trying to drive more awareness around the importance of blood pressure specific to pregnancy, but also as kind of a life course event because pregnancy is often the first time moms are are exposed to their taking their blood pressure. And, you know, every time you go to a prenatal appointment, you get your blood pressure taken, you pee in a cup, you get on the scale. And people don't often really connect the blood pressure part of that with why that's important for the rest of their lives, not just right then in pregnancy. So we were always on this path of that being a theme for 2020. And then the coronavirus thing happened. And it became a whole new level of importance because one of the things that a lot of healthcare providers are doing is limiting the number of in-person appointments that moms uh, attend their prenatal visits or possibly their postpartum visits. And so they were moving to what's often referred to as a telehealth environment, which means that they are now spending some of these appointments talking to mom on the phone or doing a video chat with her or possibly texting back and forth. But the point is she's no longer going into the office or clinic for every one of her prenatal checks, which means she's not necessarily getting her blood pressure taken. So that's a huge issue for us. I mean, the reason you get your blood pressure checked during your prenatal visits is because they're looking for preeclampsia. That's the whole reason that that prenatal care is done the way it is, is because they are looking for preeclampsia or any kind of high blood pressure in pregnancy. So if she's now having to do this, these visits from home because of the coronavirus, how is she going to get her blood pressure checked? Well, we obviously need to address that. Mom needs to have a blood pressure cuff at home. So... So this perfect storm is now converging. It's Preeclampsia Awareness Month. Our campaign is called Check, No, Share. And it's all around the importance of checking your blood pressure, knowing why you're taking it and what the numbers mean for you, and then sharing that information with your provider. And so if you layer that campaign on top of what's happening with COVID, it becomes even more important for women to be checking, knowing, and sharing. Uh, because they may not be seeing their their doctor or midwife as often as they they would have been before. So that campaign, all of the infographics, all of the social media messages that we're pushing out, all of that is uh, a huge opportunity for women to learn more about this and to share this information because any pregnant woman is at risk for developing preeclampsia. There, there are certain conditions that make somebody at higher risk, but any pregnant woman could develop preeclampsia. So it's really important that everybody know this. But then let me talk about a special program that we've launched. Yes, no, definitely go into that with us. So everything I just outlined, you know, super important. Check, no, share. Everybody needs to do this. So what happens if somebody doesn't have a blood pressure cuff at home? Can, can she just run to her local, you know, drugstore, Walgreens, CVS, whatever, and buy one? Well, some women can, and, and they can, and, and we're encouraging them to do that. Um, in some places, insurance companies will cover you, a, a doctor or a midwife prescribing a blood pressure cuff and having that covered by your insurance but we're finding that that is either very rare for that to happen or the logistics of doing the whole insurance coverage and getting a prescription and the paperwork and whatever else is associated with it is just taking too long. And we need a response. You know, women need to get a blood pressure cuff immediately. So 
the the two and then on top of that i mean i don't know if it's quite as bad as the toilet paper situation but on top of that a lot of drugstores have run out of blood pressure cups they they don't have them they can't keep them in stock because more people are having to take care of their own health and and checking vital signs like blood pressure so we're finding that it's not even that a lot of drugstores have even sold out of them so what we've done is very quickly, I mean, it's not moving nearly as quickly as I would like, but as but far quicker than, than anybody would have imagined, we have mobilized uh, working with blood pressure manufacturers, um, specifically Omron, which is a, a very good company that produces some good quality blood pressure devices. Um, we have developed very specific patient education materials to go with the blood pressure cuffs, um, and some other things kind of related to monitoring your own blood pressure and being aware of it. And so we've created this package and it's called the Cuff Kit. And we just recently announced it as a nationwide program that will make uh, cuff kits available through providers. And we're really focusing on um, women, and, and I shouldn't just say women, but areas where there is really high need, higher risk women, and the most vulnerable populations. So a lot of the provider groups that we're working with uh, are have a, a large concentration of higher risk, most vulnerable populations, and we're working with them and a number of different funders that have stepped up to help make this program possible. So we're super excited about this. And, and as a result of this, we are literally moving thousands of these cuff kits into, uh, into motion and working with providers to get them distributed to women so that they can have access to a blood pressure cuff at home. Oh, my goodness. How amazing is that? <laughs> thousands. Thousands. Yeah. Oh, it my is. gosh. It is. That is such a blessing and so needed in this time. So I would love for us to just go dig a little deeper and actually share kind of your personal journey and your personal story um, with preeclampsia and just take us back on your journey to motherhood and share with us what led you to lead this organization. So, well, it's a long story. So I will try to compress it into, you know, the, the top level points, because I say it's a long story because, um, in all honesty, my, uh, you know, I, first of all, it's a three part story, um, because I've had three pregnancies and in one way or another, they were all affected by preeclampsia and they happened a while ago and a lot has transpired since then. So, the first story is very much like most women's stories in that it it kind of sneaks up out of the blue. You have no prior knowledge of preeclampsia. I had no prior knowledge of preeclampsia. This happened 21 years ago for me. And, and it was, you know, like everybody starts their story off going, it was a perfectly normal pregnancy until it wasn't. And, and so in, in many respects, my first experience to preeclampsia mirrors what I think a lot of women have experienced, which is, you know, not necessarily knowing anything about it and not being aware of the signs and symptoms and not knowing the importance of taking your blood pressure and also not listening to um, your own voice, you know, the, that your own inner voice, that something's wrong. And all of those factors very much drive what we're doing today. And not just because it happens to me, but because it, it happens over and over again. So for my first story, uh, my first experience, I was 29 weeks, um, just a day shy of 29 weeks pregnant with our daughter. Um, I didn't know she was a little girl at the time, but um, found out soon after and experienced um, really a worsening of my condition over several weeks without really realizing that my symptoms were things that I should be uh, insisting that my healthcare provider pay attention to. So I called my OB office on a number of occasions explaining that 
I was having this just ridiculous amount of swelling and all they would tell me was drink more water and put your feet up, but none of that really helped. And so, you know, just to kind of like compress uh, what happened over the course of several weeks to a very short period of time, by the time we got to the, the culmination of all this, it was a weekend. I, I was at the gym working out and I looked down at my hands and they were bright red. And, and I had never seen them look like that before. And so I went to the person working at the gym and I said, something's wrong. And can you take my blood pressure? And I have no idea why I even asked that, but I knew that, you know, my hands being bright red probably had something to do with blood pressure. So he did. And it was, um, it was about 140 over 85. And that was extremely high for me. So my blood pressure normally ran like 100 over 55. So for me, that number that he told me was very, very high. And we waited about five. I just sat down. We waited about five minutes. He took it again. And it was still high. And I'm like, I'm going home. And unfortunately, what I did is I went home and said, I just need to go to bed. Whereas what I needed to be doing was calling my healthcare provider right away. And, you know, you'll hear a lot of this like, oh, I should have and I could have done this throughout a lot of my story, which is interesting because it kind of leads to why I ended up doing what I did. But I went home and went to bed and then uh, I basically tossed and turned all night long and got up like every 20 minutes because I had this feeling like I needed to pee. And what I realized is that I was actually un having contractions like every 20 minutes. And um, finally, about five o'clock in the morning, I was just so like crawling out of my skin, basically called the labor and delivery uh, unit at my hospital and told them what was going on. And they said, oh, it sounds like you may be having uh, you know, preterm labor, uh, why don't you come on in? So we went to the hospital and when I checked in, my blood pressure at that point was close to 160 over 110. I was seeing spots. I had a raging headache and I started vomiting. And that was at around, um, five or six in the morning and it took them until one o'clock that afternoon to transfer me to a hospital, not 10 minutes across town, because they finally, and I mean finally, diagnosed me with preeclampsia and said, we're going to, it looks like you're going to have to deliver this baby today. Well, by the time we got to that other hospital, somewhere in transit, um, my baby died. She had been alive because they had done an ultrasound and we knew that she was definitely in distress because of that ultrasound, but she was still alive. So by the time we got to the other hospital, they literally like, they had not even gotten me off the gurney yet. And the, the, the maternal fetal medicine doctor, the specialist was waiting there for me. They didn't even have me off the gurney. He had the ultrasound machine waiting. He was wanding me and he looked at me. And to this day, I can still see his eyes looking at me saying, I'm sorry, it's too late. And I just looked at him in total disbelief and just started yelling, saying, just take me into emergency surgery. Can't you get her out? You have to resuscitate. And I was saying her, it wasn't her. It was the baby. Resuscitate the baby. Just cut me open and get the baby out. And he just looked at me and said, it's too late. And Erica, that was to this day, and I've lived through a lot of different challenges in my life. To this day, that was um, the most shell-shocked uh, moment of my life. There, there is nothing more devastating than hearing that, hearing those words and not even actually not even fully comprehending it. Cause I, I gotta tell you, I mean, that's what happened at the moment. And then we went into several hours of um, having labor induced and having to deliver my baby and knowing, you know, being told that the baby had died and knowing that I'm going to be delivering a stillborn baby. And honestly, there's a part of me that did not even be fully believe that the baby had died until I delivered the baby. And 
And I remember my husband was there and I delivered her and he kind of quietly said, it's a girl. And of course there was no sound. Everybody in the room was dead quiet. Um, The only sound was a huge splashing sound. What unbeknownst to me and, and unbeknownst to the healthcare providers, I had had a placental abruption and the baby's head was serving as a cork. So I was hemorrhaging internally all this time we were waiting. And so when I delivered her, there was this huge splash as all this blood just poured, just waterfalled onto the ground, hitting the tile floor. And it turns out it was about half of my body's blood volume. So you hear this splash. The room is quiet. My husband says, it's a girl. And I just screamed like there was this sound that came out of my gut that sounded like some kind of like prehistoric wail that I don't even know that I recognized it coming from my body. But it was just this, you know, maternal anguish as I fully realized at that point that she had died. So that's that's the moment that the world changed for me, (laughs) you know, and it's certainly the most traumatic uh, pinnacle of that story. And what happened afterwards became a journey, became a spiritual journey. It became a health journey. It became um, a journey of, um, of miracles. There were many um, miracles that occurred after that. And, um, really the next year of my life was, was just profoundly impacted and not just the next year, the next many years, but in most intensely that next year of my life was profoundly impacted by that. Um, I will tell you, I'll, I'll come back to all of that in a second, but I'll just tell you real quickly that my, you know, my pregnancy journey followed with, uh, another pregnancy about a year and a half later, And I developed severe preeclampsia with that baby as well. Uh, A little boy who I was under the care of a very different, very competent doctor. So yes, I developed severe preeclampsia again, but we were monitoring it and there was no, you know, last minute crisis. It was once things started going south for me, once my blood pressure started going up, I was in the hospital being watched on an hourly basis for two, almost two weeks. It was time, you know, we, we very carefully made the decision when it's time to take the baby. And then my little boy was in the NICU for a couple of weeks. But that experience, you know, I juxtaposed that to my first situation. And, you know, I have a 20 year old son today because that pregnancy was managed so much differently and so much better. And even though I had preeclampsia twice. And then the third part of the story is that I didn't want an only child, despite everyone saying, Eleni, there's no way you can go through this again. And I saw yet another specialist who put me on uh, a special uh, blood pressure medication, even though I had no blood pressure problems in pregnancy or before pregnancy, he put me on special medication to control my cardiac output. So my heart was pumping and working way harder than a normal woman's heart should be pumping and working. And so we put me on medication to normalize what's called cardiac output. And that kept everything in control. And I was able to get through that entire third pregnancy all the way to 39 weeks, delivered almost an eight pound baby boy. And that story ends like it's it's as undramatic as the first pregnancy was dramatic. (laughs) Um, And uh, and so. At that point, we're like, okay, we're, we're done. We got to stop. <laughs> Eleni does not do pregnancy really well, so we need to be done and we need to count our blessings and, and move on from there. So that's a, a, a quick summary of the three-part story. Uh, but I will tell you, you know, and, and as you know, and as all your listeners know, there is nothing so horrifying as losing a child. And, and the journey that we go on as, um, as humans grappling with that and trying to understand 
how that kind of tragedy can can occur and how to process it, how to deal with it and how to reconcile that with our understanding and our and our belief and our faith is I mean, it's a journey. It is not <laughs> there. It, this is not a one stop uh, you know, sidebar to life. It, it, it truly changes you forever and informs everything. It informs everything. Definitely it does. So I would love for you to just share a little bit about that, about just how your faith and your spiritual journey has helped you with your healing, because obviously we know you turned your pain into purpose by being a part of pre and Foundation and definitely being the CEO now. So talk about your faith journey and your faith walk and how you know, did you struggle with your faith? You know, um, did you question God, especially during your losses and your subsequent pregnancies as you kept getting, you know, the symptoms of preeclampsia? The short answer is absolutely yes to everything you just said. Um, I don't think any journey is complete unless you've taken every exit ramp and gotten back on. <laughs> um, and, and and it's really interesting because it actually started, I mean, going back to that moment of having the doctor turn to me and say, I'm sorry, it's too late. Somewhere in the next few minutes, somebody, and I don't even know who, I, I have it hard, I, I honestly would have a hard time believing that this was my husband who said this because my husband is a Greek Orthodox priest. We are, we are both, um, lifelong Christians. And I would find it hard to believe that either one of us would have said it must be God's will. But I think that people are so even Christians, even really, you know, deeply committed Christians will often revert to God's will as an explanation for why everything happens in our lives, good, bad, whatever. And, and so maybe, but, but I think it's a, it's a bit of a trite phrase, quite frankly, sometimes that we just sort of pull out of our little bag of, you know, Christian sayings that we think apply to all situations. Right. And we throw them out there without really thinking about what we mean. And is that true? And what happened is somebody said that, and like I said, it might even have been my husband just thinking like, oh, I need to believe that this is something sent by God. And the doctor, interestingly enough, heard that, and he didn't say anything right away, but he came to me later and he said, you know, I heard, I heard you say this. And he said, if it's okay with you, I'd like to have the hospital chaplain come and talk with you. And I said, you know, Sure, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm thinking, well, what is the hospital chaplain going to tell me that I don't already know? But it turns out that this was a Lutheran hospital, and the hospital chaplain was a Catholic woman, which I thought was really interesting. So I now am being ministered to by Mary, a Catholic chaplain in a Lutheran hospital who's ministering to an Orthodox woman. And it was a really interesting um, situation. But she did come talk to me. And she just got me, she asked me some questions and she got me thinking about this idea of, is it God's will? And what it started for me, instead of her just telling me a whole bunch of platitudes and, and help, you know, and expecting me just to take it as, as gospel, so to speak, she really sent me on a journey. And I did a lot of journaling. I did a lot of reading of, um, of the early church writings. I read a lot of the saints' writings on death and the death of a child and the death of a baby. I actually spent a week in a monastery, um, just basically checking out of the world and doing a deep dive into what God has actually taught us about death and loss. And the most, you know, several really profound spiritual 
awakenings. Uh, and what was interesting is you can spend your whole life hearing this stuff, but until you experience it, it doesn't really stick. You might understand it in your mind, but you don't understand it in your soul until you actually experience this. And one of the most profound things that came to me was an understanding of the, the passage in the Bible where it is the shortest passage in the Bible, and it says, Jesus wept. And it's talking about Jesus standing at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, who, whom he is about to go raise from the dead. And even in that moment, when he knows he is about to resurrect his friend, his grief over the death of his friend is so profound that he weeps. So Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, is experiencing grief. He is validating grief as a human emotion that is worthy, that is divine. And that struck me like, okay, all this grief I'm feeling has been ordained and endorsed, if you will, by the Lord. Because he himself experienced this. He didn't sort of rise above it and go like, ugh grief. Like that's so human <laughs> and I'm so God. I don't have to have that. No, of course he did. Cause he was also fully human and he experienced that in the loss of his friend. That was one of several major ahas for me. The other major aha was that God never wills death. God is a God of life. He is a God of joy. He is a God of all that is good in the world. And when something bad happens, it has not been willed by God. It may have been allowed by him, but there's a difference between allowing something and willing it. And the reason bad things happen in the world is not because God has willed them, but because we live in a fallen world and frankly, bad crap happens <laughs> and, and God allows it because through him, we can then seek out the meaning, the joy, and the purpose in that bad stuff happening. And so that was, you know, these are just some of what I, I worked through and, and eventually came to. And let me say with like no amount of um, understatement that these discoveries of my own came through, like I said, I spent a week in the monastery. I took time off from work. I, I went through a journaling process that included a, a workshop called writing through loss that was set in a beautiful Japanese garden. And I spent all day in this guided writing um, process. There was um, exposing our pain to our faith community. So we actually had a funeral for our daughter. We had a memorial service. We had hundreds of people come from our church community to the funeral and to the memorial service. And we spoke very honestly and very profoundly about this loss of a baby who some would say was never a baby and was never born. And we said, oh, yes, she was. And what happened is by talking about this very publicly to our church community, we did not suffer alone. And we had many people come to us and come out of their own darkness. I had one woman who was 80 years old. And she approached me sobbing and grabbed my hands and looked at me and said, thank you. And I said, thank you. What? For what? And she went on to tell me that she had been harboring her own grief and pain from a child she had lost 50 years earlier, more than 50 years earlier, that she had never felt the permission to grieve over. And by, by having us talk about this publicly and invite our community into our pain, it gave her permission to grieve. And so for the first time in her life, she just unloaded. And this happened over and over again. Um, and so, and this was very, I got to tell you, Erica, that was not who I was. I was an extremely private person. And it was my husband kind of, you know, dragging me, kicking and screaming into this idea of, 
inviting other people into our pain. And I just, up until then, I had felt like, no, this is my personal horror that I need to work through. And by opening it up and by being public with it, it not only helped us, but in helping other people, it helped us. So community is really at the heart of, of um, suffering and healing together. And that not and that not suffering alone piece. And that's so um, that's even so much more important when you have something like preeclampsia. One of the most common themes that you hear when you start talking to women who had preeclampsia is the feeling of isolation, the feeling that nobody else is experiencing this. Everyone else is going through these picture perfect pregnancies and having you know, nowadays we're having reveal parties and like, it's not just enough to have one baby shower. We're having three baby showers. Like the whole, um, everything that we've wrapped around the process of having a baby is always around the joy and beauty of it, which it should be. It is a beautiful, joyful thing. But as a result, those of us who have something horrible happen are pushed into the shadows and we don't feel like anyone else is experiencing this. And so we feel isolated. We feel like this pain that we're bearing is only our pain. And that is, you know, the number one thing that I would say to anybody is, no, it's not. It's not only your pain. Share it. You will bless others by sharing it and you will be blessed by it. Oh, man. Yes. I love everything you just said. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Um, I want hope. Hopefully my listeners will replay this because you definitely spoke to me. And really, when you talked about, you know, Jesus wept and how he was fully man and fully God and he still experienced grief, you know, um, I've heard, you know, so many different preachers preach that scripture and each time, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks to me a different way, no different than he spoke it through you today. So hopefully everyone got it. Hopefully the spirit speaks to them too, but, um, this, that was excellent and sharing that with us. I appreciate you. Absolutely. I would love for you to leave our listeners with um, just some encouraging words on um, this journey. You know, everyone's at a different place in their healing journey. A lot of the listeners um, may have may or may be battling infertility and their fertility treatments have been put on hold due to COVID-19. And then we do have some listeners who are pregnant after their losses and are going through this new challenge and this new anxiety and fears with this coronavirus. So what encouraging words can you leave the listeners? I would say, think about addressing the needs of your mind, heart, and soul, because all three of those need tending to in dealing with uh, anxiety and, and stressors of not feeling like you're getting what you, what you wanted out of your Um, childbearing experience. And, you know, it's interesting. So let me, let me talk about each of those three briefly, but then also let me say that in some ways, the COVID crisis that we're dealing with is in some ways it is no different than the anxiety that anybody will have after being pregnant after a loss. Any subsequent pregnancy is going to be fraught with some level of anxiety and concerns. And and it's different for different people. And a lot of that's driven by your personality. A lot of it may be driven by your your personal health situation. And some of it may be driven by um, just how you how you handle you know, how much control or lack of control you need in your life. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of factors that drive how we move through anxiety and an anxiety, a situation fraught with anxiety. So a couple things, one about the COVID situation, hospitals and, and healthcare facilities have done a superb job of protecting and being prepared for the COVID situation. What's really interesting, right? And so you will be potentially facing some of those things. You you may be facing healthcare providers that look really um, kind of scary, right? They're going to be all dressed up and having this protective gear on, and and it may feel very impersonal to you. 
And they're doing all this to protect themselves and to protect you and to protect your loved ones. So you have to realize that they're doing all of this for the better good. Um, You will be cared for and protected in a really safe way. But what's interesting is what we don't want to happen, and, and this is a really strong admonition, I would say to all your listeners, don't let the fear of COVID or any of those things keep you away from getting the health care that you need. The risk of you, of you or your baby dying or having a very bad outcome from preeclampsia or a hypertensive disorder or, or some other crisis in your pregnancy is way worse. That risk is worse than dying of COVID. I really want to emphasize for people that if you have signs and symptoms, if you have concerns, you absolutely need to be talking to your healthcare provider about them. If you have blood pressure readings that are 160 over 110 or higher or numbers that are approaching that, that are very abnormal for you, you absolutely need to seek immediate medical care. Do not let COVID keep you away. Um, So that's one thing that I, I just want to say about COVID. The anxiety of trying to get through a subsequent pregnancy after having had a loss is very real. And so this is where I say, like, address the needs of your mind, heart, and soul. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's head knowledge that you're going to gain by exploring what are your physical issues that you have to address. So trying to see a specialist to understand, do I have underlying conditions that are contributing to my situation, whether it's infertility or um, if I've had a previous pregnancy loss, like as much as possible trying to understand what is going on with my body that may be contributing to it and that I can possibly do something about. And there may be something you can do about it, or there may not. I mean, in my situation, I had absolutely no pre-existing risk factors. Even after I got checked out uh, after the first pregnancy, there was nothing that we technically, you know, thought we could address because I didn't have any of these, you know, clotting disorders or any of these issues. Um, we, we even, I went on aspirin in my second pregnancy, which is something that we're asked, you know, we are advising more women to do these days. And it may have helped a little bit because I did get further along in the second pregnancy. But anyway, so I guess what I'm saying by addressing, you know, your mind is, is fully embrace learning what today's best science can tell us and do what you can do so that you feel like, Hey, I've done all I can do. Then you have to address the heart and soul piece of it. And the heart of it is recognize what are the drivers of anxiety that you might be feeling and see what you can do working with your provider to address those. So for me, my healthcare provider, my doctor in my second pregnancy was a godsend. He and I were so in sync and he knew that I was somebody who needed a lot of information and he gave it to me. He spent time with me. He, you know, my appointments for him were never like in and out in three minutes. Um, and because I needed that, I needed to give myself the peace that we were doing everything we could do for this pregnancy. And then the last piece of it is for your soul and for your faith and being in communion with the Lord and being in constant conversation and asking for the peace of, I've done everything I can do. I need you to do the rest. (laughs) You know, we often hear this expression like, pray like it all depends on him and work as if it all depends on you. And when you combine the two, that's what the Lord wants of us. He wants us to fully trust him and he wants us to do everything we can do as well. And so moving through our pregnancies and, and these situations, I think it's the same thing. Like, you know, do whatever you can do and pray and put your faith in him because he's doing, he's, he's carrying us. <laughs> and, and so that constant dance that we do, and then when you do start to freak out or you start to feel anxious, um, you know, just continually reminding yourself. And, and I will, you know, I made an illusion early in, in our conversation, Erica, about the number of miracles that occurred through my pregnancies. In my second pregnancy, 
when I should have been scared to death the whole time that this was going to happen again, I actually had a great deal of peace. And part of it is because I did get a very profound message very early in that pregnancy. And it was, it was an absolute message from God that said, number one, he told me that it was going to be a boy, by the way, I'm, I'm weeks along and I started bleeding. Um, I started bleeding and I went to my healthcare, to, to my doctor who took the blood test and said that my HCG level. So this is the hormone that's supposed to rise very quickly early in pregnancy that basically helps everything like get on the right track in terms of the pregnancy. Well, he took my blood test and we took it again a few days later and my HCG levels were dropping, not rising the way they should have been. And he said, I don't want you to get attached to this pregnancy. You're probably going to miscarry. This doesn't, this isn't taking the way it should be. And that was devastating to me. And I, I had, I went to church because we were having a service that night anyways. And throughout that service, there was I mean, God was talking to me like he and I were the only people, the only entities, I can't call him a person, but the only entities in the universe. And he told me, you are going to have this baby. It is a boy. You are going to name him Jordan and, and it is going to be fine. And that happened at a time when the doctor was telling me this pregnancy isn't going to work. So that message had to carry me through the rest of that pregnancy, even when things continued to go bad. And I had to keep reminding myself, God said this was going to be fine. He didn't say it wasn't going to be without problems. He didn't say there weren't going to be little like bumps in the road, but he said that this baby was going to be fine. So I had to keep reminding myself of that. And, you know, that was the message for me. My, my, my words of encouragement to other women is, it, you know, we don't know where, where anybody's journey is going to end. And so just thinking about the three pieces of who you are and doing what you can do to, to feed each of those elements uh, and, and together, you know, that's, that's the whole person. Our mind, body, and soul is the whole person and that needs to be addressed. And I, I think so much of what you offer your listeners and so much uh, of what the of what God has told us. I mean, we we don't actually have to search that hard to know that that God has promised us in the end it will all be okay. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. Man, oh man, thank you for sharing that. I love that little nugget. <laughs> that is so good. I would love for you to share where we can connect with you and the Preclampsia Foundation and all the events that you all are having during the month of May and beyond after this episode. Absolutely. Well, the first thing I would say is a lot of the information I talked about with the blood pressure campaign for Preclampsia Awareness Month, uh, go to preeclampsia.org slash blood hyphen pressure. So you will go and you'll see an infographic. There are several videos there. We interviewed a bunch of uh, doctors who talked about some of the things that, that I'm talking about, but of course they are so much wiser than I am. Um, so go and check out some of those videos and that's at preeclampsia.org slash blood hyphen pressure. All of our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, YouTube, all of those channels are just chock full of important information and messages that we are pushing out throughout the month. And I would really encourage women to go and pick those up, share them with your communities, comment on them, share your own stories. I mean, like I said, community is um, it's all about community. And we also have a, a Facebook group that we recently launched called Preeclampsia Foundation Community Connection. And that's for a lot of our ambassadors and volunteers and supporters who are looking, you know, they've kind of moved beyond the um, their own personal crisis and they're ready to start making a difference for others. And that's, by the way, a big component of healing is kind of getting out of your own skin and your own sorrows all the time and looking out and going, what can I do to help others? That will actually contribute to healing as well. 
So community connection is a place that we invite people who are ready to start helping and and getting involved and doing things. So I would invite you to think about joining that. And like I said, all of our social media channels and of course our website, preeclampsia.org is just full of uh, great information. Thank you so much, Lenny, for being on the podcast and sharing your story with us and the Preeclampsia Foundation. I'm so happy we connected back in Rhode, was it Rhode Island back last year? It was, it was, <laughs> yes. Um, and um, obviously, you know, now being a part of Mama's Voices and the Racial Disparity Coalition that you all have has been a blessing to me. So I thank you for your leadership and um, definitely um, recommended me to be a part of um, all of these different coalitions, a part of the Preeclampsia Foundation. Absolutely, Erica. You know, it, it was such a blessing for me to, to, to meet you. I mean, I, I didn't even know about your presentation until until we were already at this conference. And I remember thinking uh, I had to be in like two places at once. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, how am I going to hear her talk and this other talk? And, you know, it, it just struck me that what you've created with Sisters in Loss is exactly the community that that I referenced. And that is so important to help people with healing And I know that you definitely focus and kind of specialize in bringing women of color into that community and really helping them feel like their their loss and their their struggles, that they have a community to to struggle with and to um, to feel connected with. And I remember thinking all of us who have lost babies are in community together. And there is definitely a universal part of this that transcends the color of our skin and transcends, you know, our, our families of origin and how we were raised and, and even what our belief system is. And there is this sort of higher level, if you will, of connection that brings all of us together who have ever, ever suffered the loss of a child that I just really appreciate how, I don't know. You, I think you bring a great balm, you know, like a like a salve, if that's the right word, to women who who have suffered this these kinds of losses. And so, I guess that's a very long winded way of saying thank you so much for everything that you're doing, because uh, it's just it's critically important. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. For show notes and more information on today's guests, go to sistersinlost.com. If you have not joined our online community, go to sistersinlost.com as well as sign up for our newsletter. We want you to be a part of the community so you can know all of the events that we have planned on as Sisters in Lost. Go to sistersinlost.com, sign up for our newsletter, join our online community and stay connected with us. Talk to you soon.